day Saturday training that I think is priced at like $29 or something like that. Um, Darlene Parker is doing a three-day course April 5th to 7th. Let me point these things out. So this Saturday, March 16th, Real Estate Records, passive income course starting April 13th and Georgia Rhea has gone into adding another day. It might have to be a five day course, which is fine because I can speak for five days, trust me. Um, Anthony Tower is then going to do a, uh, a boot camp June 6th tonight on the same subject, apartment complexes. We have a 90 day wholesaling program with Shannon White. This is the one that got postponed from April and that's going to happen in June. And again, we have 19 subgroups per month. Check out your calendar. We have a speaker this Wednesday at Deal Makers. For those of you who might make Deal Makers, we're going to have a DIY bug spray guy. Always the best. You know, always fun. All right, without any further ado, I think we need to get Miss Anthony up here. Thank you. No? Where's Rick? Go ahead and get your tools. That wasn't the plan, Rick. Right? Okay, I got it. You got it. I would love to introduce Mr. Chara. However, he has so many credentials and so many things going on, I would not do him justice unless I actually read it. We went to a national real meeting a few years ago. We sent some members of the board and I went. And one of the things the national RIA did on their own was meet to rate all the national speakers uh, without the speakers being present, of course. And I believe Mr. Tara came up as number one, or maybe it was number two, one or the other. We are honored to get this guy. He's not an easy guy to get. He's very knowledgeable. I think he'll enjoy the presentation. I will say that. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. He is not an easy guy to get. We had to fly to Utah and buy a bunch of beers and get him drunk. The coerce him to come. It is very difficult, actually. Um, so we are lucky to have him. Uh, he's, he's been around for several decades, and, and uh, he's done 1,800 apartment units, syndication. Um, I'm excited to hear about syndication. I, I, it's an area that I'd love to hear more about, and I can't think of a better speaker. Uh, total values in 43 uh, million, ranging from 31 units uh, in Pennsylvania to 410 unit portfolio in Indianapolis. Um, during the past 20 years, he's owned and managed several successful multi-million dollar companies. Uh, he started a teaching career in September 2006, educated both beginning investors and more sophisticated investors about how to successfully invest in apartments and multi-units. He also volunteered and supports several worthwhile charities, such as the American Red Cross and the Denver Rescue Mission, uh, Habitat for Humanity, St. Jude Hospital, and uh, the Wounded Warrior Project, also one of our passions. Without any further ado, please all welcome Anthony Chara. I know it's always hard when you guys are networking to come back because you've got all that energy and you're talking to new people and exchanging information and business cards and then you got to come back and listen to me. No, that's okay. I'll try and keep the energy going here. So yes, I invest in apartments. I started investing way back in 1993. And I moved into apartments almost exclusively in about 2004. So one of the things I do when I do my presentations is not only try and educate you, but as part of the way I try and educate you, I ask you questions. So they're not rhetorical. I really would like you to answer whatever that answer is for you. So the first question I have for you, well, I actually ask the questions for a couple reasons. Besides keep you involved, it also helps keep you awake. And it also helps me to understand that you are participating and learning as we go through this whole process. So first question I have is, what do these 600 doors have in common? You own them. They have rent. I own them. They open. Most of them open, yes. They all generate income. Or most of them generate income because occasionally somebody does what? Or doesn't do something, right? They, they move or they don't pay rent. So I don't go out and I don't... 
evict anybody because I have managers on all of my apartments and all of my multifamily property. <clears throat> now, people ask me all the time, Anthony, how many units do you have to have to have a property manager? To me, this is passive investing, so my answer is always the same. It's one unit to have a property manager. That's my opinion. You can go with it, don't go with it, or whatever the case might be, but here I have a question for you. How many of you, I did mention I'm going to ask, ask a lot of questions, right? So here, by show of hands, how many of you have ever invested in a stock either directly or through a mutual fund or something like that? Excellent. Let me ask you another question. The day after you bought the stock, how many of you went to that company and got a job so that you could keep an eye on the people that were running the company to make sure you were making money? Wow, not a single person. Oh, one person. One person did. The day after you bought the stock. Excellent. <laughs> There's always one, right? And so the question is, why didn't you go get a job at the company when you bought the stock? Because you were an investor. So if you're a real estate investor, why are you showing the units and cleaning the units and fixing the units and taking out tenants and applications and all that kind of stuff? If you, by the way, if you love doing that kind of stuff, keep doing it, because life is way too short. But the point I'm trying to get at is if you're a real estate investor, your investment should be doing what? Paying someone else to do it for you, so you could be doing what? Whatever the hell you want to do. With whoever you want to do it with, anytime you want to do it. Got it? So that's why I got into apartments, so I can start doing more of what I love to do instead of what my company told me to do. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. So, 1,600 units. The other thing I want to tell you about this, and the thing that's, that's really important is because a lot of people, when I talk to them, they'll say, well, Anthony, I don't have any money, or I don't have enough money to go out and buy a 10 unit, 20 unit, 50 unit, 100 unit building. I don't have the education. Guess what I'm here. I don't have partners. I don't know where to find them and all that kind of stuff. So I help you with a lot of that stuff. But ultimately, on every single one of these apartment complexes, I own every single one with partners. I have money partners, experienced partners. When I first started up, we needed experienced partners because I didn't have experience. You guys can borrow other people's money, right? You go to a bank or you can go to private lenders, you can borrow their money. So guess what? You can also borrow people's experience. You can also borrow people's credit. So we have other people that actually sign on the loan documents for us because they're willing to exchange their credit and their net worth so that we can go out and get an apartment building. And we give them a piece of that deal. How much you give them, you negotiate with, with that particular person or those people that sign for you. But it's all possible. So don't hold yourself back thinking that you can't do it when there's ways that you can get this kind of stuff done. So as I mentioned earlier, I started investing in 93. I was doing single family homes for about 10 years until I met a couple of mentors. One is a guy named Robert Allen. Anybody know Robert Allen? Yeah. He wrote a book years ago called No Money Down. Great book. Became one of his protégés. Paid a lot of money, went to a bunch of different classes, tried all the different classes. And let me ask you if this looks familiar. How many of you, by show of hands, do wholesaling? Okay, how about fixing and flipping or fixing and holding? Does this look familiar? Try and write nice and big so you guys can see it the back. You go out and you do a deal. If you know what you're doing, you make a lot of money? Well, one person said yes. <laughs> so apparently you guys need some more training on how to do this the right way. If you know what you're doing and do this the right way, you make a good chunk of money. Yes. Whatever that means for you, yeah. right? Then you go along, you do another deal, you make another chunk of money, yes? Yes. Excellent. You go along, do another chunk of money. What happens when you're not doing deals? Not no money. In case you don't get this, let me give you some sound effects, ready? What happens when you're not doing deals? You're flatlining, right? You're dead. You have to constantly go out and get deals, get deals, get deals, get deals. Look at the volume turn down just, just a head. All right, let me ask you another question. How long is it between these two peaks, between these two deals? Three months at least. Three days, three weeks, three months. 
Okay, most of the time when I ask a question, people answer two. <laughs> Some people take quite a long time in between getting deals. And what happens is you have no income coming in. You get a chunk of income and then you're back down to what? Zero. So here's what I'm recommending. By the way, I'm not su even suggesting that you stop doing single family home purchases, buy and holds, fix and flips, wholesale, or any of that. What I'd like to do is help you add another tool to your financial investment tool bag, which is apartments, and take a chunk of this money as it comes in and start utilizing it to get rid of these valleys. So you don't have to go back down to zero. What you're doing is you're resetting your bottom line because now you have passive income coming in. This is passive income. What kind of income? Passive. Passive income. So that you have that money con con consistently coming in because some of you probably still have a job and you're trying to do all of this in between working. Start taking some of that money and invest it in bigger projects that have passive income so you don't have to keep going back down to the zero line. One other thing you should do too is you should go out and figure out what's called your break even line. Your break even line. How many of you read Rich Dad Poor Dad? Excellent. You guys remember when Robert Kiyosaki talked about the difference between wealthy and rich? One of the things he talked about was that wealthy people, rich people have a huge bank account, a huge net worth. Wealthy people have what kind of income coming in? Passive. Passive income that does what? Surpasses their monthly expenses. That's what makes them wealthy. Guess what the break-even line is? Your everyday, day in and day out, expenses that you have to, that you're spending in order to survive. Your house payment, your car payment, food, utilities, <coughs> Xbox games, cell phones, right? All the things that you want to do that you need to survive, that's your break even line. What is that number on a monthly basis? Your goal is to create enough passive income to surpass that line. That's what puts you into the wealthy category. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay? So, I learned that, of course, from reading the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then, of course, going out and actually starting to do it, and it allowed us, me, my wife and I, to go out and do more of what we wanted to do when we wanted to do it. So I started by going to Robert Allen classes, and one of the things that I was taught was how to do wholesaling and fixing and flipping and all that kind of stuff, and I realized that whenever I got done, I was right back down here and I had to go find another job, because that's really what this is. This is a job. Unless you have people that are going out and finding stuff for you, and I didn't want to keep doing that. I'd rather do this. I actually enjoy doing this, going around the t country, teaching people how to do what I do. So I wanted to spend more time what I, doing what I wanted to do instead of what I needed to do in order to survive. The other mentor that I met was a guy named Ron in Denver. And Ron taught me some of the stuff that I'm going to teach you later tonight. But the big thing that taught me was Ron when we were sitting down at lunch, actually we, the way we got to lunch, we met at a business opportunity meeting, and we went around the table, everybody introduced themselves, and Ron had about 450 apartment units. And I'm thinking, wow, this is great, because I'm ready to go to the next level. And I had about somewhere between eight and 10 single family homes and condos, and Ron was there, and I said, hey, Ron, multimillionaire, got 450 units, can I take you to lunch? Guess what he said? Yeah. Thank you, one person, got it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He said yes. He said he only had one rule, and that was I had to buy lunch. I said, great. Burger King or McDonald's? <laughs> no, we didn't go to Burger King or McDonald's. We went to a nice Italian restaurant. We sat down for a couple of hours. He told me, like I said, some of the stuff that I'm going to teach you tonight. But one of the things that really impressed me was that out of his 450 units, he was making about $140,000 to $150,000 in passive income. Anybody want $140,000, $150,000 in passive income? Excellent. I left out the part that that was every single month. Now anybody want an extra 140? Yeah. And, and of course, as soon as he said that, it's like, okay, that's it, I'm done, I'm making the transition and going into apartments because that was a huge amount of cash flow. It's still a huge amount of cash flow. So it really rocked my world and I was ready to move forward. So he started teaching some of the stuff. And then since then, uh, I pretty much got into apartments full time around 2004. Partnered with other people, as I mentioned, and then at our peak, we we're actually up around 1,800 units. Now I know we're suffering a little bit. We're down to about 1,600. We sold a bunch. We bought some more. And I'm going to show you some of those right now. So these are all over the country. I don't have any multifamilies in Colorado, in Denver, where I'm at. I have single family homes, 
but the numbers never really worked for me there, so we found other places around the country where the numbers did work. This one up here, actually these two are both in Ohio, this one's in Florida, this one's in Kansas, actually this one's in, no, that one's in Iowa, this one's in Kansas. Oh, by the way, this one, you guys know where Macon is? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this one's a 100 unit property down in Macon, this one's in Texas, this one's in uh, Nevada, Colorado, uh, that one's in Florida, that one's in Nevada. By the way, this one is in the country of Belize, if anybody knows where the country of Belize is. We have a couple of fourplexes down there, this is actually part of the Hilton Hotel chain. We bought into a Curio Hotel down there, so that's uh, awesome. By the way, one of the things I like about doing what I do and being in real estate, Somebody has to go down and check on the project. On the end of the process. <laughs> Did I mention that I live in Denver? Yes. One of the reasons I'm down here in March, because it's about 20 degrees colder in Denver right now. As a matter of fact, we're expecting a bunch of snow on Tuesday and Wednesday, or actually Wednesday and the Thursday. So the other thing I started doing is I started doing this. I started teaching classes because I found out from some of the other classes I went to and other people that I ran into that there was a lot of stuff, there seemed to be a lot of stuff missing with the education. So my partner and I started doing this, and we've been teaching classes since 2006, and I do it because I love to do it. When we first started doing it, it was because it was two reasons. Number one, it was an extra stream of income, way back in 2006. The other reason we started doing it is because my partner and I knew that our pockets were not endless, and we could potentially find people to partner with on our deals. So we started teaching these classes. I usually have people ask me what it takes to be successful. And there's five main categories that you need to understand. The first one is to learn the market. Then, of course, learn how the market, how the apartments are valued, learn where to find your deals, how to fund them, how to figure them, how to do all the math and everything else. And then, of course, in the end is leaving a legacy and passing that on to other people. So if you notice, the first one says, doesn't say go out and find a deal, does it? No, it says go out and find the market. Figure out if your market is the right time or the right strategy that you need to use in your market. So would you guys like to learn a little bit about Atlanta? Yes. Just in case you don't know what's going on in Atlanta. Here's what's going on in Atlanta. Putting the best places.net. Last year, jobs grew almost 3%. It's projected to have, you're projected to have another 47% jobs over the next 10 years. That's all, it's over 4.5% job growth. That's actually really, really good, really, really strong. Unemployment's still a little bit high, 4.2 compared to the national average. And your population, I was actually surprised at this. I thought that was kind of low. Your population's only increased less than 12% since 2000. Really? Really? That's what I said, too, when I read that. It's like, only 11%? <clears throat> Here's what happened in 2008. So let's look back, and then we'll look forward. 2008. Sorry, 2018. So you added about 55,000 jobs last year. You also added almost 9,300 more apartment units. Those are just apartment units. And even with that 9,300 addition, the occupancy only decreased a tenth of a percent, but your rents also went up 3.4%. By the way, how many of you in here by show of hands raise your rent every single year? Excellent, good for you. Those of you that are not raising your hands, you either don't own any rental property, or by the end of tonight's presentation, you're gonna understand why you need to raise your rent every single year. Here's what they're forecasting for 2019. They're projecting another 45, 46,000 jobs. So by the way, they're also forecasting that both the economy and the multifamily markets in Atlanta will remain very, very strong in 2019. Uh, 11,700 units are gonna be added. These are just department units in 2019. Absorption will lag deliveries by 11% though. Now absorption is a key phrase or a key term that you need to understand. Absorption measures how many new units come on the market compared to how many units are rented within the first 90 days. So if you notice, it says that absorptions are going to be lagging, which means there's going to be more deliveries than units occupied in the next year. However, even with that 11% lag, occupancy is still only projected to decrease another one-tenth of one percent, which means there's still a lot of people moving into the market and moving into those units. And even with that slight decrease in occupancy, rents are projected to go up another 3.6%. This is a graph that just shows you the numbers I just talked about. So this shows your vacancy over here from 2013 to 2019, what's projected. This also shows the rental rate increase. Is that a nice little increase there? So way back in 2013, the average unit was bringing in about $950 a month. Now it's up over $1,200. 
Yes, you should have come to my class way back here. Because <laughs> this is, this is I think, the third or fourth time I've been here to Atlanta. Uh, anyway, so if you notice here, this is absorption and delivery. So if you notice over here, 13, 14, and 15, there was a lot more absorption than delivery. That's one of the reasons these rental rates jumped up quite a bit. And now that the market just is it's heated up and going through the roof, the rental rates are still going up. But if you notice here in 16, 17, and again in 18, there's a few more deliveries than there are absorption. So things are starting to slow down a little bit, but they still remain very, very strong. This is a free report that you can get from blackcreekgroup.com, blackcreekgroup.com. Unfortunately, this is the, the latest one that they have available. It's way back in the second quarter, but it shows the, the cycles that real estate is in. You've got recovery, expansion, hypersupply, and recession. So if you notice over here, they're showing that the Atlanta apartment market is in hypersupply. That means exactly what I just showed you. Rental rates are still going up, but absorption is starting to slow, and eventually what will happen is rental rates will keep going up, development will keep going up, but then what will happen is vacancy will start to increase drastically, and then you move into recession. By the way, that doesn't mean you can't buy. I buy in every single one of these cycles, but I don't use the same strategy in each one of these cycles, or each one of these phases. Because if I pay something over here, if I pay something, a, a, a performing property full price, I'm probably going to be upside down when it goes into recession and then have to wait for the market to come back to both recovery and then expansion for rental rates and value of the property to go back up again. This is another free report from IRR.com. IRR.com, again, this is the same thing. It shows recovery, expansion, hypersupply, and recession. They show Atlanta is in the first phase of hypersupply, just like the last report. So again, that means things aren't slowing down yet, but they will be slowing down. They will start to slow down, especially when it gets down here to the late hypersupply and into recession. But one of the issues you can run into here in hypersupply is you have a lot of sellers who are potentially over here through expansion living the high life thinking, well, you know, what's going to happen? You guys remember back, how many of you were investing back in 2004, 2005? Excellent. Back then, you guys knew that real estate never went down in value, right? <laughs> yeah. What happened in 06, 07, 08? <clears throat> Unfortunately, you're going to find some sellers that are thinking that exact same thing if you try and buy a property here. Not all of them, but some of them will still think, oh, no, no, the market's still going like this. I'm going to write it out. I'm going to ask for top dollar or more than top dollar. So you might have a little bit of an issue, but I'm going to show you some strategies you can use a little bit to get around that. This is another report. This is not a free report. This is a, a site that I pay a subscription for. This is from apartmentalerts.com. This also shows that the housing market in this area, the Atlanta area, is slowing down. Notice there's a lot of yellow and a little bit of red, which means things are slowing. These are momentum scores. You can see that. They're actually fairly low in the, in the mid and low to upper 30s. This is also another uh, map picture that actually shows you how hot the market is. So this is kind of like a rainbow. It starts with the red colors, which means the area is very hot. Then it goes to orange, yellow, uh, lime green, dark green, all the way down to the purples and the blues. So if you notice here, Atlanta is very, very hot. Macon, eh, you know, so, so. It actually, compared to Atlanta, it doesn't look all that hot, but I'm going to show you in a second here where if some of you are interested in the Macon area or even the Warren, Warren Roberts or, or um, uh, I'm sorry, Warner Robins, or Rome, you might want to consider, or even Delta up here, not Delta, Dalton, right? Yeah. Dalton, you might want to consider maybe moving outside of your area a little bit. So right now it shows that Atlanta is very hot, Macon's doing pretty well, Athens and Warner Robins are eh, so-so, Rome is doing really well, Dalton's doing really well. But here's where it changes. This is the momentum score. If you notice here, anything less than 100 is still good, but it also shows that the area is kind of cooling off a little bit. So this is, that's why it's cool, right? It's light blue, it looks like ice here. But look at Macon. Macon, uh, this has a score of 82. Macon has a score of almost 300. Warner Robins, 261. Athens, 260. Rome, 219. So as this part cools, and here's what happens in a lot of major metropolitan areas. As prices up here get out of control for some people, whether you're an investor or someone who's looking for a place to buy or rent, what do you do when you can't afford this area? Right? You start moving out to the submarkets to see if there's something out here that you might be able to afford, even if it means a longer commute. So I think what you're seeing here is you're seeing a lot of people who are moving out of this area and moving out to the periphery 
to find something that will work for them price-wise, whether it's purchase price or rental rates. This is another little indicator that just shows where the, the market is. And right now, the market, as I showed you earlier, is very hot, very strong. That's just showing Atlanta. If there, were, if there were arrows on this, either to the right or the left, it would show you the momentum, whether the area is getting stronger or weaker. In this case, it's not getting stronger or weaker. It's just strong, and it's been strong for at least the last quarter <clears throat> because there are no arrows pushing it up or pushing it down. This one here is another map. It's going to show you appreciation by zip code. So this is the, a very, very wide swath. It goes from way down here. matter of fact, way down here, you can see Savannah. And then it comes up here, you got Marietta, right in this general area we're at right now, all the way up to the Tennessee border. And again, just like a rainbow, anything that's in red, down to orange, to yellow, is very, very good. And it's cooling off, then you get to light green, dark green, and then you get into your blues, light blues and purples. So this is the whole area. I'm going to go back and forth a couple of times so you can kind of get your bearings based on the interstates and the roadways. So if you notice right in here, it's, there's a lot, there's some yellow and, and uh, orange. So we're going to go into that in just a second. But if you notice, dark green is very good. There's a lot of good areas in here, even the bright lime greens. So that's the larger area. Now we'll zoom in a little bit more. So if we come into the actual loop here, you can see here's Marietta. This goes down to Lake City, College Park. Atlanta, of course, is right in the middle. And here's the numbers here. So this actually shows you by zip code. 332, 30310. In the 18%, 24% uh, range, that's how much the area has appreciated in the last two years. Now, you have to keep in mind, there's more that you need to understand within the numbers. In some of these areas, especially in major metropolitan areas, you have some areas where you could go out and buy a home for $30,000. Well, if you buy a home for $30,000 and you put some work into it and increase it to $50,000, did the value of your property just go up exponentially? Right, it just went up about 20 to 40 percent. Well, guess what? Some of that could be what's going on in some of these areas. So you need to understand the areas, but these should be some areas you might want to target on and focus on for those of you that are doing active investing because these are some of the hotter markets. So if you notice these areas, the areas that are in yellow, those are also very hot markets. Then you've got your light green, which is in the 11 percent range. This whole area up in here, over here. And then you've got the dark green. And even the dark green area is doing extremely well. You had 8% growth here over the last two years, 6.2, 7.3, 8.8. So not some bad numbers. And again, that also goes along with all the other information that I put up there, that the area is doing extremely well, but it is showing signs of doing what? It's slowing down. So it's slowing down and cooling off just a little bit. Okay? This is the last graph I'm going to put up. This actually just shows all the major areas around the entire state. If you notice, where's Atlanta? Trick question, where's Atlanta? Number two, right? Okay. If you notice over here, if the numbers are starting in the 60s and 70s, and then it goes up into the 80s and 90s, and then it kind of drops back down a little bit. That's one of the reasons the momentum is waning. <clears throat> Macon, which I talked about earlier, right here, if you notice Macon, it's in the 60s and 70s, then it goes to the 70s and 80s, into the 80s and 90s. There's still a couple low numbers here, so there's still some catching up to do, but it looks like it's improving. So if we looked at this in another three months, six months, 12 months, Macon will probably start to move up. Atlanta will probably start to move down. Okay, so you can just kind of get an idea of where everything is. If you live anywhere near these areas or invest in these areas, chances are they're probably going to start going up because there's nowhere else for them to go down. All right. I, I lied. There's one more graph. This is another one. This is also from Housealerts.com. This is what they call their wealth phase chart. Anytime this wealth phase is in green, it means it's a good time to buy. And if you look over here, from about 2012, 2013 through the present, you've had some really, really, really good appreciation in the Alaska market. That's averaged over 6% for the last six years. So not bad. As a matter of fact, the last couple of years, it's been up in the 7 to 8% range. So yeah, things are starting to cool off, but it's still, this is still showing it's a good time to buy and invest in the Atlanta area. Whew. Any questions before we move on? Yes? So are you seeing variation across classes, types of properties, or is that generally true across all the different classes? Am I seeing variations across classes? You're talking about classes A, B, C classes? Okay, these reports don't take that into consideration. This is everything all combined and melted together. 
So I can't, I can't answer that from different classes. Certainly your A-class properties are gonna go up a lot higher and a lot faster, but uh, there actually is one of the reports that I was reading from Mercadia.com, in fact, that was one of the websites that was up there. It is showing that A-class properties are cooling off, but B-class, B and B-minus properties are actually increasing because they're now catching up to the A-class product. So if you want to invest in some type of apartment complex, the B and B-minus class would be the place to go, in my opinion, right now, based on what's happening in the market. But all this information here is all everything together. Okay, any other questions? Yes? These charts are all based on commercial properties? Commercial no, they're properties. based on, the first half was based on commercial properties. The second half is based on the single family house market, but the single family house market also affects the multifamily market. Because as, as single family homes start to get priced out of the realm for people to buy or rent, they start moving into apartment complexes. So um, you're gonna see, let me go back here. Let me go back a little bit. Okay, so like all this stuff here, this all has to do with the housing market. But again, as the housing market heats up, if people can't afford to live in these areas, they're gonna start moving into apartments. So the reason I look at this is because if people start getting priced out of uh, homes in this particular area, they're gonna need a place to live. And if you have a certain amount of rent that you have to get in your, um, for your particular property, and you can't, if you can't get it, you basically shouldn't be buying in that area because not everybody can afford the rent that you need to charge in order to even cover your mortgage payment in a hot market. So a lot of times what happens is, especially in areas like California, New York, people buy for appreciation. They actually buy and then rent a property at less than what their, rental, their mortgage rate is. So they're actually losing. They actually have negative income each year, actually each month, but the reason they're doing it is because they're banking that the appreciation is gonna be high enough in their particular market that it's gonna compensate them at some point in the future. I know a lot of people that did that in 2003, 2004, 2005. Guess what happened in six, seven, and eight? Yeah, their value went in the toilet. They ended up losing their properties. As a matter of fact, I know one person lost 42 properties because he was banking on nothing but appreciation. All right, any other questions? Last question. What about the condo market? What about the condo market? <laughs> is it increasing in Atlanta? Again, the apartment market is going to increase based on interest rates and based on the cost of housing in this particular area. So if you're looking to buy condos, now would be a good time to buy a condo because what's going to happen is as the housing prices go up, if people can't afford the houses, guess where they're going to move? They're moving into condos. But guess what's the first market that goes down? Condos. Condos are usually the last market to come up in a cycle and they're usually the first to go down in a cycle. Their cycle is very, very short because not a lot of people love living in condos. They, some of them, they, they basically, it's like, it's like buying your own apartment building. Who wants to live in an apartment building for the rest of their lives? Not a lot of people because you're surrounded by everybody else. You usually have common walls, you got the noise, you got everybody next to you, and there's not much privacy. Okay, by the way, one of the things that I do in all my presentations, so I'll do it tonight, I'll do it on Saturday the 30th, when I come back for the one day workshop, I stick around and answer all of your questions. I don't run away, I stick around. Matter of fact, there's a lot of times when I come out and do these presentations, I'm here until 11, 12 o'clock at night. So if you want to keep asking me questions, I will stick around and answer all your questions. Got it? Got it? Yeah. 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 All right, moving on. So if the market is slowing down, what's one of the things you can do? Well, one of the things you can do is possibly go buy in a different area. So here's some different areas you might want to consider. According to Zillow, these are the top 10 areas where what they consider to be the most affordable real estate markets based on percentage of income. So based on your percentage of income, this is how much, or the, these are the top markets that you want to get into because it's the least amount of your income that goes to your housing. So Oklahoma City is the most affordable market in the country. These are large markets, by the way. It's the most affordable one in the country. Last year, Kansas City was number one. A year later, it's now number 10. Why do you think Kansas City has moved from number one to number 10? Any ideas? Prices went up. Prices went up. Why did prices go up? Because there's number one place to go. So why were people going there to buy property a year ago? Because they knew they could buy property at a very good rate, and the rents were really, really low. So guess what happened when all these real estate investors went to Kansas City and started raising rents? 
they started making a lot more money and now it costs a little bit more out of your pocket to pay for your housing in those markets. So what do you think is going to happen to some of these areas? <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. So these are some areas you might want to consider looking at if you're looking to buy investment property. <coughs> this one is from Realtor.com. It's just what they think is going to be the top 10 markets in 2019. This is based on their research of where people are moving to for a variety of reasons. It's about job growth, housing costs, uh, wages going up or wage increases. By the way, if you notice, Grand Rapids comes up on quite a few lists. There's a lot of stuff going on in Grand Rapids. A lot of very large international companies are growing and moving to Grand Rapids. Why? I have no idea. <laughs> but they are. Actually, Grand Rapids is nice. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to be funny, but Grand Rapids is a really nice area. And of course, it's on the uh, western side or eastern side of uh, one of the lake states, Lake Michigan, I believe. So it's a really nice area to live, and it's, it's just now starting to boom. So again, if you're interested in moving to a market that has some great upside, this one is from Trulia.com. This is what they think are going to be the top five markets. And if you notice, I get multiple sources for my information. I don't rely on one source. I get as much information as I can from different sources because I want to see if there's consistency. So far, what have you seen for consistency? Grand Rapids. All right, here's another one. This is from Forbes. These are the best bets for 2019. These are the top 10 bets of what they think are going to be the best markets for real estate. This is also based on job growth, population growth, the value for the properties. Orlando's number one. Unfortunately, Grand Rapids doesn't come up on the list. But if you notice, there's a lot of areas up here that I wouldn't necessarily invest in that are doing very well. Cleveland, Indianapolis, Portland, of course, is doing well. I think Portland is going to drop off the list now that they just passed rent control in the entire state. Yes. Do you think investors are going to start or are going to want to buy property in anywhere in the state of Oregon now that you have rent control? Probably not. It's called taking capitalism away from the people and putting it in the hands of the government because they know best. Okay. Anyway, one of the things you can do is buy in a different market. The second thing you can do is change your strategy. How many of you by show of hands do fix and flips and fix and holds? Excellent. So imagine this. <laughs> imagine that. Imagine going out, instead of buying one single family unit, why not go out and buy 10, 20, 30, 40 at a time? You heard earlier tonight, they talked about the benefits you get as a Georgia Rea member from Home Depot. One of the things you get is a 2% rebate that adds up. Matter of fact, the, the uh, real estate group that I belong to in Colorado, their average member gets about $750 a year in rebates. <coughs> so instead of going into Home Depot and buying a five gallon bucket of paint, how about buying 10 or 20 five gallon buckets of paint? By the way, you also get an extra discount too. You don't just get the 2% rebate when you buy paint, you get something like a 20 or 25% discount when you buy paint with your Georgia Rea membership. <clears throat> you also imagine going in, instead of buying carpet or flooring of some type for one single family home, you go in and buy enough for 20 or 30 units. Or you go out, instead of buying one stove or one refrigerator, you buy 10, 20, 30 stoves and refrigerators. You think they might be more interested in working with you and giving you some more discounts? on top of your rebate? Yes, absolutely. This is what we're doing around the country. We're going in and spending this kind of money in order to get additional discounts because people walk in. When you walk into the store, it's if yes sir, no sir. Right? They want to assist you and they recognize you when you walk in, especially when you come up to the, to, to the pro desk. So this might be something, if you're doing fix and flips, stop thinking about doing one at a time. Right? You're doing one at a time, you're basically doing this over here. But if you start doing 20 or 30 at a time, guess what happens? You start multiplying your income, you start multiplying the effects and the value of your time. Those of you that are doing fix and flips, does it take you, is it fair to say it takes you somewhere between one and two months to actually do the work, buy it, and then do the work and get it ready? Longer, okay? Longer. Do you think, it, let's, say, let's say it was two months. Do you think it's gonna take you two months for every single unit in a 20 unit building? No, why not? Because you're going to get into a rhythm. You and your contractors get into a rhythm. One set of people come in and do the demolition, and when they move to the next one and start doing the demolition, other people come in and start doing what? Painting, cabinets, flooring, and that kind of stuff, right? And they start getting on a schedule. You can save and amplify your time 
exponentially by getting into apartments instead of doing one single family at a time. Another thing you can do is, stop changing, where it go? Oh, I went the wrong way, that's why. Is shift to a different commercial class. If things are slowing down, maybe you might want to consider a different commercial class. And when you see at the end of the night, or throughout the night, I'm going to put up some other things on the chart over here, so you can see why you might want to consider moving to a commercial class instead of just sticking with single-family homes. So here's, this is also from blackcreekgroup.com. This shows all the different types of commercial class, hotel, industrial, retail, health facilities, and even office space. So this is where Atlanta is, according to their report. Atlanta is in expansion when it comes to office supplies. You notice here, or office market. It looks like it just started into expansion. So maybe now is a very good time to start looking at some type of office space in the Atlanta area. This is telling me that there isn't a whole lot and they're starting to build a lot more in order to make up for the new companies that are moving in that need that space in order to continue to survive. This is the same report from IRR.com. They are also showing Atlanta. In this case, they're showing Atlanta is a little bit weaker when it comes to office. They're showing that it's in recovery. So either way, you're on the upswing for your properties if you consider buying some type of office class. This is for the retail market. The retail, if you notice over here, according to Black Creek, this is actually on the precipice. It's about to go from expansion into hypersupply. So it still could be a good time to buy because even in hypersupply, the market is still going to go up for another period of time. It could be another one, two, three years, maybe even four years where this is going to continue to go up and you'll continue to reap benefits from, from your retail uh, space. This is, again, IRR with retail space. They think it's a little bit weaker. They take different numbers from different sources and they crunch the number and this is where they think the number the, the market is here with uh, Atlanta. Okay? Then you have the hotel cycle. Hotel cycle, again, looks like it's about ready to go from expansion into hypersupply. There is no hotel market for, or hotel slide for IRR.com. So we jump over here to industrial. Industrial, they show it's an expansion, but again, it's right on the precipice. It's about to go from expansion into hypersupply. So it's still gonna be strong for a little while, but that could be a short time, it could be a longer time period as new product comes on the market, especially with all the people moving into the market. Then you have the industrial cycle from IRR. They're showing that it's still expanding. So they're not quite as, they're not tipped over quite as far as Black Creek, but they still show that the industrial cycle is very strong. <sighs> okay, any questions on any of that? <coughs> if I bored you completely to death, you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> you guys learned anything? Yeah. You guys glad you live in Atlanta? Yeah. Excellent, glad you're here. Last time I was here, the, the uh, Falcons were playing the Saints on Monday Night Football. Oh. There was about five people in here. <laughs> Actually, I'm kidding. There's actually just as many as here. There's about 120 to 150 people, so it was nice. So apparently they're either not Falcons fans or they recorded it and can watch it later. But anyway, any questions? No. All right, let's move on. So let me show you what some of my students have done with apartments. Dave came to me. Dave was one of those people that came to me and said, Anthony, I do fix and flips. What should I do? And guess what I told him? Why are you doing one at a time? He actually listened to me. If I could only get my wife to listen to me, I'd be happy. But... <laughs> I know. I, by the way, I'm one of those people, you guys have heard the phrase, happy wife, happy life. Yeah, I've been married almost 30 years. I've still not learned that lesson. <laughs> Trust me, just, just ask my wife and she'll tell you. Anyway, so Dave came to me and said, Anthony, what should I do? And I said, dude, you need to get into apartments. Why are you only doing one at a time? So he actually did it. He went out and he found a 23-unit property. By the way, he found this property on a little website called Craigslist. Anybody heard of Craigslist? Next. He did the same thing he was always doing for single family homes. He was putting in things like handyman special, fixer upper, needs work, motivated seller. This popped up, 23 units in Stratton. What's, what's the challenge with this property? The what? If the location is in Stratton, Colorado, is that the problem? <laughs> By the way, this is about two hours east of downtown Denver. What's, look at the numbers, what's the challenge? Vacancy, right? The thing is almost vacant. All Dave wanted to do was, was decrease the vacancy. He didn't even touch the income. He didn't even look at that. And just by changing the vacancy, look what happened to his, his NOI, his net operating income, almost went up 10 times. 
Now, for those of you, by the show of hands, how many of you know what NOI means and as far as how it affects the value of the commercial property? Excellent, a lot of you, that's great. So are you guys drooling looking at these numbers? Yeah, but wait, there's more. All right, so the first thing Dave needed to understand was cap rate. You need to figure out the cap rate for this type of property in this market. So how do you do that? You talk to experts in the market, you find out what similar properties are selling for in that area. There weren't any similar properties anywhere near Stratton. So Dave, trying to be conservative, used a 10% cap rate. Actually, think about it, he used 11% cap rate because he wanted to be even more conservative. He wanted to, by the way, the higher the cap rate you use, the lower the value of the property. The lower the cap rate, the higher the value. So Dave went from, he thought it was a 10 cap, he raised it to 11 to lower his and his investors' expectations a little bit so that he could under-promise and over-deliver. So what he did is, uh, this is also what the other thing you need to look at is your NOI divided by your cap rate gives you the value for the property. So let's look at Dave's numbers in combination with something called forced depreciation. By increasing the income, by decreasing the vacancy, the value of the property was going to go up exponentially. <clears throat> Again, using the wealth formula, if you take the NOI and divide it by the cap rate, if any time you increase this number here, the value of the property goes up, whether it's through increasing income or decreasing expenses. So this will show you right here. This is what's called a very simplified APOD, Annual Property Operating Data Report. It's the income, which is all the income generated from the property, minus the operational expenses. I put this up here you can see, so you can see all of the operational expenses. Notice the debt service isn't in there. The debt service comes out after the fact, so it doesn't affect the value of the property. And then what's left over is your cash flow, also known as profit. Excellent. Okay, so if we increase income or decrease expenses, the NOI goes up, the value of the property goes up. So what happens? Up here, if we take Dave's numbers and move them up to the top, this is what happens. He was using 11% cap rate. Based on the actual NOI, divided by 11%, the value of the property was only worth about $41,000. Now that's based on what's called the income approach to valuation. There's three ways to value a property. What I'm going to teach you tonight, and what I'm going to teach you on Saturday the 30th, is about the income valuation. The second one is comparables. You're used to comparables with your single family homes. There's a whole bunch of homes in an area, they've all sold over the last six months. You can figure out based on square footage, bedrooms, air conditioning, pool, what yours is worth based on adding and subtracting different fees for different uh, amenities on the property. <clears throat> with apartments, they can do the same thing, but there's a lot less of them, so they can go out about two years. And the third way is what's called replacement costs. If the building burned to the ground, what would it cost in today's dollars or in future dollars to rebuild that property from the ground up? Assuming that you don't have to remake the dirt, you just have to redo the walls and the ceiling and the electric and plumbing and all that stuff. So on this particular property, based on the income approach, it was worth about $41,000. Even completely vacant, it was worth more than that. Because it had walls, it kind of had a roof, <laughs> as you'll see in a second. It had plumbing that was leaking. It had electricity and everything else that went on with it. So just a matter of fixing that property up and putting it back into use. So Dave projected that it was going to be worth about $400,000 when he was done with it with his revised numbers of $44,000 in NOI. Now the question for Dave at this point is, what was it going to cost him to get it? How much did he, could he buy it for? How much did he have to put into it to make it a $400,000 property? Because that's Especially if you guys are doing fix and flips, that's the number one thing, right? It, you have to figure out what's, what it's worth when you're done with it, how much is it going to cost you to fix it up and hold it, and what can you buy it for, and is there a good profit in between? So let's take a look at the numbers. By the way, I said there was kind of a roof, right? There were four layers of shingles on this roof. Well, over here there was only about one or less than one. By the way, this did not come with the property. And when Dave's crew showed up to start working on the property, they had that delivered. But yeah, there were four layers of shingles on there. This building was actually built in the late 1800s. It used to be an old stagecoach stop. <clears throat> okay, there's the inside, and there's the hole in the roof up there. You can see it. By the way, the reason this property was vacant, the guy that owned the property was a hoarder. And so most of the units looked like that. Yeah, no living, breathing people. <laughs> Just junk. 
Okay? There's the other sign. You notice that up there? That looks great. All right, so what do you do? He figured it with me over lunch. The biggest thing that I told Dave was the biggest factor he was going to have, the biggest concern I had was the fact that it was in Stratton, which is two hours east of downtown Denver. There's only 500 people in town. Very, very, very small market. I mentioned to him that if, the, if a major employer moved out, he could be upside down very, very quickly, assuming that he got it turned around in the first place, which he was confident he could. Dave went out and did his research and found out there were no major employers. <laughs> they were all very small uh, motels, gas stations, diners. A lot of them were farmers. A lot of farm, uh, very uh, big farm community. So there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of big businesses that they had to worry about. So he was okay with it. Now, look at how much he paid for it. $65,000 to buy 23 units. By the way, the seller had it advertised at $99,000. Dave got him come down to $65,000 because he showed him a picture of the roof. And said, you know, that's going to cost me about fifty grand to fix the roof. So they said, oh, okay. So they compromised. Came down about $25,000, grand, Actually, about twenty-five grand. By the way, he got a hard money lender. Any hard money lenders in the room? One, two, excellent. So answer this question for me. D Dave showed you, or if Dave showed you, based on his numbers and his knowledge, that this property, he was very confident this property would be worth around $400,000 when he was done with it. Would you loan him $50,000 to buy it? <laughs> I have one, yeah, I have most definitely, and a yes. Excellent. By the way, he got the seller, SCB is seller carry back. He got the seller to carry back a $15,000 note. So that makes up the 65. But wait. There's more. There's more. He got a second hard money lender to go into third position. Wow. To give him a $140,000 amount of money to do the rehab work. Would you go into third position? No. Even with the LTV being at 50%? No. No. How about you? Now, are you saying no because he said no, or are you saying no because <laughs> okay. So let me ask you a question. What's your name in the back? Uh, Mike. Louder. My name? Yeah. Mike. Michael? Yes. So Michael, let me ask you a question. If I could show you a property that was worth, a, a Harper property worth 400000 when I was done with it, would you buy out the first or second position and come into first position yourself for yeah. 205000 Yeah, we have to be first lane only. First lien only, but you would do it for two hundred five thousand if I can prove to you it was worth four hundred. Yes. Excellent. And what's your name? The Rick. lady in the back. Rick. Rick. <laughs> <laughs> no, the lady in the, the lady in the back row that said she was a hard money lender. I was not paying attention. What's your name? Oh, I'm sorry. Her name's Frank. <laughs> And I grew up in Southern California too. What's your name? Jeannie. Jeannie. See, it's not Rick. It's Jeannie. Jeannie, would you buy somebody the first and second position out and go into first position and give a $205,000 loan on a property that could be worth over $400,000? Yes. Excellent. Everybody in here should get Michael and Jeannie and maybe even Rick's uh, cards on their way out. So that you, because you have sources right there that have just told you they will fund these deals for you. So if you notice on this particular deal, six months later, Dave went in, did all the work, rehab the property. By the way, that's the same unit that had the hole in the roof. Looks nice, huh? Look at this really hard industrial crappy carpet. But guess what? People moved in. He's got a waiting list. This is, you know, what year was that made? <laughs> there were a lot of units that they put in carpet and nobody ever moved in. So Dave just went in, they steam cleaned it, and it came right back to life and people moved in. They were fine with it. By the way, the average rent on this property when Dave bought it, $295 a month. Wow. Woohoo. <laughs> there's the outside now. You like the new roof? Yeah. They painted it, they redid the parking lot. There's uh, Dave and his wife Carla. Carla's waving, going, hey everybody, we're going to show a lot of money. <laughs> Carla would never say the yes word, but you guys get the idea. All right, so what happened? So Dave went out after he got done with it, went to a couple banks, and one of the banks said, we don't think it's an 11 cap, we don't think it's a 10 cap, we think it's an 8 cap. Based on an 8 cap, guess how much the property was worth? $525,000. Excellent guess, sir. $525,000. So what did Dave do? He put $200,000 in his pocket 
He had to leave $150,000 on the table because the bank has an LTV requirement, loan to value, so they would only loan 75% of the new value. He put that in his pocket, it was cash flowing, this was a couple years ago, it was cash flowing 2,200 bucks a month. He split that with a person that came in and signed the loan for him, so Dave didn't even sign on the loan. You like that? He actually did what I taught him. But oh, wait, how much money does Dave have in this deal? Zero. Dave has no money in this deal at all. And I just told you two, maybe three sources that could possibly help you. How many of you have no money to do a deal like this? <laughs> Because as you can see, you don't have to have money to do deals like this. Now certainly, if you have money, you can get things done a lot faster. You can do more deals. But don't let that hold you back from doing deals. There are people out there like these hard money lenders that loan Dave money and they will loan you money if you find a decent deal and the numbers work. You just need to be able to crunch the numbers, figure out if it works, and then present it to them so that they're as excited as you are and want to loan you that money. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, would you like to hear from Dave? Yes. Okay. Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. Cross your fingers. Hi, uh, my name is Dave Sanchez. I'm from Hudson, Colorado. Uh, I've actually took Anthony's class two years ago, and I'm just retaking it now. In that time, since I've met Anthony, I've been able to acquire quite a few apartments. We've sold some. Uh, we're down to 122 units right now. We have another 52 unit under contract, and we're looking at another 96 unit to get that under contract. So I highly recommend his class. Uh, everything you need to get started in apartments is in this class, and if you just do the follow-up and do what he teaches you, uh, you also can have a lot of apartments. Thank you. There you go. Thank you, Dave. That was a few years ago. Dave is now up over 800 units. Yeah, he's going on gangbusters. By the way, I still think he has little to no money in every single one of his deals. All right, so here's another one. This is a Mike and a Dave went out. They found the 60 units of Burlington, Iowa through a real estate agent. Oh, what a novel idea. Creating a relationship with a real estate agent in the area. This particular property, the agent also buys this same type of property. So when Dave and Mike brought it to me, I said, wait a second, I know this agent likes these properties. Why is he buying it? And they said two reasons. Number one, it's too small. He only buys 100 units and more. Number two, it was two and a half hours from his home market, so it was too far away. So what did he do? He found it, turned it over to Mike and Dave, because he knows this is what they're looking for. On this particular one, it, we bought, including repairs, we're buying it for about, we actually already bought it, we bought it last May, so we've had it 10 months. We paid uh, roughly 1.9 million for it with the 260. We have a takeout bridge loan that was supposed to be in place last year. We're actually starting that loan process right now. By the end of this month, we will have our loan docs in because we need to fund uh, finance out of what we can call a bridge loan. A bridge loan is a fancy term for hard money loan, except they use bridge loan when it comes to commercial property. And uh, that was the terms that we were getting on this particular note. Last year, we checked in, it was an 85% LTV with a 35-year AM at 4% interest. No balloon, no adjustment, locked in, just like a single family home for 35 years. You like that? Okay, HUD FHA does these types of loans. They're one of the only lenders out there that will do the full 30, 35, up to 40 year amortized loan to 85% with no adjustment, no balloon. Okay, I select a credit partner, we raised $600,000 to buy from my sources. The goal for this particular property is to do nothing but lower expenses and by lowering expenses, we'll increase the value of the property by a half a million bucks. Now, as I mentioned earlier, right, if you increase the income or decrease the expenses, either way, the NOI goes up. When the NOI goes up, the value of the property goes up. So why were we confident that we could reduce the expenses? The seller and one of the owners of the property was the property management company running the property. So not only were they, oops, not only were they running it, for as a property manager, but they were also running it as the investment group, or for the investment group. <coughs> so what did that mean? <coughs> they, were, they were more than double dipping. They were getting 27% of the profit off the top for all of their 
portions of ownership and fees. So all, our goal was to do nothing but lower expenses from 70%. They had 70% expenses. So 70 cents out of every dollar they made went out into expenses. They had left 30% left over for profit and for the debt service. Our goal was to lower it from 70 to 60. By lowering it from 70 to 60, we increased the value of $500,000. There's the property. Gorgeous property, nice little area in Kansas. It has three-year-old roofs, three-year-old siding, three-year-old AC and furnaces. Three years ago, the fire department came through and saw in the upper windows, way up in here in the bedrooms, that they had through the window air conditioning units. Well, why the fire department didn't say anything about this earlier, we have no idea, by the way, they don't care. But they looked at it and said, no, you can't have air conditioning units in the windows because that's an emergency egress. They made them pull them all out. Well, where does heat go in the summertime? Uh, so without air conditioning up here, do you think people were going to stay or were they going to move out pretty quickly? They were going to move out. So what they did is they made the choice to go in and replace. They pulled out all the AC units. Matter of fact, you can see the wall units that were in the lower level. They pulled them all out, put in all new furnaces and air conditioning units. Did all that three years ago. So we have three-year-old roofs, three-year-old siding, three-year-old AC and furnaces. And all we have to do is lower expenses. Here's another one, the last one. Yep. How did we know going into this that they were taking 27% of the income? When we first, yes, exactly. So it was part of due diligence. When we first went into it, we had no idea. We just knew the expenses were high based on our preliminary numbers. But we looked at the numbers and said, yes, there's a possibility here of a pretty good deal. Then as part of due diligence going through is when we found out that they were taking 27%. And then we went from, you know, just really liking it to drool was streaming out of our mouths. And yeah, it was really, it was a killer deal. So what is the, The percentage of property management now is, is about, uh, right now it's about 7 to 8%. It's between 7 and 8%. And it, it does vary a little bit because they don't just get their property management fee. They also get a fee every time they put somebody in the property. They also get a fee when they relet the property. So there's there's extra to it. I think we're actually paying around 5 or 6% of the straight management fee. But when you add in the other charges, it goes up to 7 8 possibly 9%. It's still a heck of a lot lower. It's still more than 20% less than what they were taking. All right, so let me show you something else real quick here. I told you, right, if the income goes up and the expenses go down, either way, the value of the property goes up, right? So we had one property where the, the landscaper was charging $2,000 a month. For, a room, for an area of grass, it was probably three quarters of this room a month. And this was in Cincinnati. So six months out of the year, six to seven months, they were mowing the lawn. The other five to six months, they were doing what? Shoveling, Shoveling snow. There isn't that much snow in Cincinnati. They actually have more ice than they do snow. So at so it, it, uh, $2,000 a month, when we went out and got estimates, the estimates came back at six to $800 is what we should have been paying. So let's say we use the higher one at $800. Well, that's $800 per month. How many months in a year? Equals what? <coughs> sorry, sorry. Let me rephrase that. I did this wrong. This is how much we're now paying. Thank you. This is this is how much we saved. Twelve hundred dollars per month times twelve months. Fourteen thousand four hundred. First and foremost, that goes guess where? Hip National Bank. Number one. <laughs> Number two, when you use the wealth formula and divide this by the cap rate, if this was in a 10 cap rate market or 10%, take 14,400 divided by 10%, what do you get? $144,000 increase in the value of the property just by changing landscapers alone. Do the residents know or care that you change landscapers? No, as long as what? The lawn gets mowed, the weeds get pulled, and the ground, everything gets trimmed, right? What if this was in a nine cap market? Take 14,000, by the way, those of you that have your calculators, some of you call them cell phones. <laughs> Take the 14,400, sorry, yeah, 14,400, divide it by 9% or 0 0.09. What do you get? 160. $160,000. This particular property, when we bought it, was in an eight and a half cap market. It went up $170,000 in value just by changing landscapers. But wait, 
There's more. <laughs> that was decreasing expenses, yes? yes? What happens if you increase rent? Same thing. Show of hands, how many of you in here own an apartment complex with five or more units in one complex? How many units? 16. 16. 16? Five. Five? Walter? 12. 12? Okay, so we'll go with the 16. So let me ask you a question. Do you raise the rent every year? Say yes. Okay, good. <laughs> yes. How much did you raise the rent last year? $50. $50 a month. Okay, grab your calculators. 16 units times $50 equals what? $800 times 12. $96,000. Sorry. $9,600, yes? $9,600. $9,600 per year in extra cash flow. Do you know what the cap rate is for your property in your area? It's in Macon as well. It's around, I would say, conservative like nine, nine and a half. Nine? Okay, so let's say nine. So take $9,600 and divide it by 0 0.09 or 9%. Nine percent. One hundred six six hundred. One hundred seven thousand dollars. So every single year he raises rent. Well, you may you're probably not going to raise it fifty dollars every single year. But this last year, twenty. Two hundred twenty-five this year coming up. You're, this coming year you're going to raise it two hundred twenty-five. No, twenty-five dollars. Oh, another twenty-five. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I, the last presentation I did, someone actually raised their rent $300 a month. They went into an area for a building that was not well taken care of, needed some work. When they went in and did the work, they raised the rent to $300 and they're filling the thing up. He's going to raise it again next year as well too. So that's, that's an anomaly, but it does happen if you go out and look for those properties. So this year alone, the value of this property went up almost $107,000. Next year, it's going to go up half that if he does another $25,000. $25 increase. Got it? Yes. Let me ask you a question. If you raise the rent $25 a month in your single family home, how much does the value of the property go up? <laughs> exactly. Now can you see why I changed from single family homes to apartments? <laughs> By the way, I, I still have, as I mentioned, I still have single family homes. They still appreciate at different rates and depreciate at different rates in apartments. You want to have that ability to have multiple property sources. And different types of properties. Because here's the other thing. Do you think it would be easier to sell a single family home yeah. or an apartment building? Single. Right, single family, right? There's more of them. And people need a place to live. You're not going to buy this because you're going to live there. You don't live there, right? No. Okay, good. <laughs> you're not buying it because you live there, but the fact is someone is going to live there and it's not going to be you. Someone wants to live there, somebody needs to live there. Most people need a place to live. That's why I don't have storage facilities, I don't have office space. <coughs> But there's people that love that kind of stuff, and they have it. I like apartments because everybody needs a place to live, and not everybody needs some of those other things. Yes, sir? What you're talking about is exactly what Trump did in Hamilton County, Ohio, to Cincinnati. Trump did this in Hamilton County, Ohio. By the way, on that property that he did this with, six months later they condemned it and knocked the whole thing over. Did you know that? And then they knocked it over. Yeah. So, all right, you had a question or comment? I was going to ask about self-storage, but I think you said you don't invest in self-storage. Well, you can ask me a question on self-storage, but let's do it at the end since I want to keep going on this. Right, right. Did I mention I'll stick around and answer all your questions? Yeah. yeah. Anybody else have a question? Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah. Rick? I have a question on cap rates because um, they used to be, you know, nine, and now I see it at six and a half in Atlanta. But California, they're at one, one percent. Yep. So, uh, I don't know what's going on with cap rates. What do you see as the, uh, the where do you see the cap rates at in different parts of the southeast, and where do you see them going? So where do I see cap rates in different parts of the southeast, and where do I see them going? I see them starting to slow down a little bit, and in some areas of the country, they're slowly starting to tick up. But another big thing that you're going to find is because of people from California. That's one of the reasons a lot of areas outside of California. The cap rates are compressing because people are overpaying for the properties. I'll meet people that say, well, you can't go buy cap rates because cap rates are arbitrary. Well, no, they're not. It's 
It's based on, so I showed you the wealth formula, which is net operating income divided by cap rate. But you can flip that around too and take the net operating income and divide it by the purchase price, and that shows you what the cap rate is for that property at the time of purchase. And what's happening in a lot of areas is people from California or even foreign money, there's a lot of foreign money coming into Oregon and Washington, and matter of fact, even New York and Florida, there's a lot of foreign money. A lot of um, Asian money is coming into the West Coast. A lot of European money is coming into the East Coast. And what they're doing is they're overpaying for properties, which is forcing the cap rates down. So that's one of the reasons they're forced down. But for you, if you already own a property in that area, your cap rate is getting compressed or forced down, the value of your property goes up exponentially. So now might be a good time to sell if you have one in some of those areas. Atlanta is going to keep going for a little while longer, as I showed earlier. So cap rates are going to kind of stay around that same level where they're at now, but eventually they are going to start creeping back up. Everything goes in cycles. It's going to happen. Do you agree? Or are you just asking because you don't know? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I see you that you do a parking and commercial mortgages, so you must have your finger on the pulse there, right? I mean, yeah, I see that they're around seven and a half now. And some people are promising six and a half to sell you your buildings for it. I miss the days when they were at nine and a half and, and ten, and I'm wondering when they're going to be back to nine. Um, I mean, no one has a crystal uh, ball to tell us. It's going to take for them to get back to nine. It's going to take some type of major situation within the economy that's going to drive them down. Eventually, they may slowly creep back to that amount, but a lot of it is just like single-family homes. It's all supply and demand. As long as the supply is out there and the demand stays strong, your cap rates are going to stay low. If developers keep going and keep building like crazy and don't slow themselves down, then you're going to see an overabundance of available units, and then naturally the price is going to have to come down if people want to sell those properties. When prices come down, the cap rates go up. Okay? All right. So moving on. Here's Dee's. Dee Dee has a 100 unit property. Her 100 unit property, she funded it with a, a couple of partners and a private placement memorandum. <clears throat> she raised a million dollars for the purchase and for some rehab work. Three years into the project, so she bought it for 2.8. Three years into the project, she refinanced it for 4.4 million. She pulled out about 725,000 bucks. She gave $660,000 back to the investors, so she returned 66% of their equity, and they still keep their ownership stake. Do you think her investors are happy three years into this deal? Yeah, now guess what she did with that money when she gave it back to them? She said, oh, by the way, I have another project in Cincinnati. She funded it like that from the people. She only needed about 350,000 to buy that property. It was a 58 unit property that she partnered with a couple other students up in Cincinnati, and that one, she's killing it on that one as well. <clears throat> so this is the property before she bought it, or as she bought it. You love that sign? It's a plywood sign with stencil lettering. <laughs> Looks like a place you'd want to live, right? That's the laundry room right there. Laundry room flooring looks uh, really good. Unfortunately, I don't have a, a updated picture on that, but I can show you some other updated pictures on the property. She went in, they cleaned up the landscaping, the trees were overdone, the lawn needed to be edged, the trees need to be trimmed, the bushes need to be trimmed, the fences need to be replaced. This is the manager's office. It was a hole when people walked into it, very uninviting. Everything was partitioned off. She opened it up, put in some really nice stuff, and then there's the new sign. Does that look inviting as people drive by? Does that look like, you look at it and go, wow, this looks like a place I might want to live. Why? Because it's all about the first impression. And the first impression starts with the sign and the landscaping. And then, of course, the second impression is walking into the manager's office. So, one of the things that I would like you to do is to start writing your own story. That's one of the reasons you're here tonight, is it not? So you can learn about investing in apartments and other commercial property. <clears throat> so, Start writing your own story. Don't let other people write it for you. Take control of your life and take control of your destiny because life is too short. So how do you do that? Well, on Saturday, March 30th, I have a one-day workshop coming up. It is all day and it is a workshop. You will be working and calculating numbers and doing problems and looking at deals and that kind of stuff throughout the day. As a matter of fact, I would like you to bring in your own deals, whether it's one that you already own or one that you find, whether it's through a broker or on a website, it just needs to be five units or more. You really want to get, if you can get it, the last 12 months of income and expenses and what's called the current rent roll. That shows the current rent that they're getting on the property and the occupancy level currently at the property. We can 
fill, figure out all the rest of the numbers based on that information. Now, some of you, if you are interested in other things like mobile home parks, storage facilities, office buildings, retail space, space, you can bring those deals in as well. I will stick around at the end of the day and go through those with you. During the actual class, we're just going to concentrate on apartments because more people are interested in apartments. Got it? Got it? Yeah. Excellent. But bring your live deals because in the afternoon, what we're going to be doing, actually throughout the entire day, you're going to be putting your deals into my quick analysis software, which I'm going to give you as long as you sign up before the deadline date. So you need to pay attention to this. First off, it's going to be on the 30th. It will be 9 to 5. There's the price right now. Rick, do I have that correct? Even non-members get it tonight for 29 bucks. Yes, that's correct. Okay. But the price, uh, and it looked like on your website, the price goes up, doesn't go up until the 23rd? Uh, whatever you say is correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I believe the price stays there until the 23rd, but you need to get signed up before the 22nd, and here's why. But wait. <laughs> If you sign up tonight, preferably, or before, on before the 22nd, you get a couple of things. You get my quick analysis software, which I'm going to show you in a second, which is $179 value. And you get a workbook that has all the slides in it and space to take your notes. So you don't have to do what all these people are doing. <laughs> Taking pictures of the different slides, you will have them handy. In order to get that, though, you need to sign up on or before the 22nd. If you sign up after the 22nd, you will not get the software. If you delay and don't take action, you will not be rewarded. The whole idea is to reward you for taking action. You may get a workbook, but I will not promise it. We do print some extra workbooks, but we don't print a whole lot. So if people don't show up that did pay for it, we'll give you one of theirs around 9.30 or 10 o'clock if we have extras, but don't count on it. Get signed up early. Here's the quick analysis software. And this is what we use to go through the properties. There's a pro forma column, an actual column, what if one, what if two, what if three, and what if four. So we take the numbers that the seller gives us and we just put them in here. Then we go to these other four columns and we make adjustments and corrections. And I teach you about that throughout the day on the 30th. At the very bottom, this is where all the numbers come together. This is that property I was showing you with had, that had the landscaper that was paying, they were paying too much for the landscaper. They went from an 11% cash on cash return at the start of the property, and by the start of year two, they went up to about a 28, 29% cash on cash return by getting rid of the property, the, no, not property, getting rid of the landscaper, increasing the rent slightly, and increasing the occupancy slightly. That was it, okay? I also have, I'll go through this very quickly because I know some of you, um, oh, we're actually out of time. A couple things very, very quickly. I do have a home study course. Yes, this is it. Even though it looks, power, it looks small, it's very, very powerful. Don't let the size confuse you. This actually has 37 files on it and over a gigabyte of information. Audio files, video files, spreadsheets that you can use to, to figure out the value of the property before and after you go under contract. Paper, um, forms that you can use to make offers and addendums that you can add to your contracts to protect you. That's all included in here. As a matter of fact, here are the eight audio files. We step you through all seven steps of buying any property. It doesn't matter if it's an apartment building or a single family home or an office building. There's seven steps that you have to go through to find it, analyze it, negotiate it, get it under contract, do your due diligence and everything that goes along with it. That's all included in here. Okay? There's also the forms. There's eight, seven or eight, nine different forms in there. Provisions, addendums, LOIs, letters of intent that you can use to make your offers. There's also software. The two biggest pieces of software in here is the what I call my quick analysis software. There's also APOD software, annual property operating data, which is much, much more detailed. I'll show you more about that on Saturday. There's also another great uh, software that's in here, or spreadsheet that's in here, is what I call my, uh, my rent my uh, sample rent analysis software, or rent roll analysis. A lot of people will tell you a property has 5% vacancy, and the fact is it might physically only have 5% vacancy, but economically, which is far more important, there might be 20, 25, 30% vacancy. You need to understand the difference, and that's one of the things that I teach you in the home study course, and you can actually go through step-by-step step in the software that I give you 
to figure out your true economic occupancy or economic vacancy to, to see if you're going to get screwed by buying the property by believing the seller or proving to the seller that they're full of you know what. Okay? There's also two video tutorials. The two video tutorials teach you how to use the quick analysis in the APOD software. They're both about an hour long. So no matter what I tell you on Saturday with the, the quick analysis software, you can go back in here and watch the video and I go through box by box by box by box and show you what I do, why I do it, and how you make changes. There's also two bonus audios. Not only do you get them on here, but one of the bonuses you get for coming tonight, you need to make sure you get this on your way out, is a quick little flash drive. It's got two audio programs on it. They're both 75 minutes each. One is why I love apartment buildings. It goes into even more detail about what I talked to about here tonight. And then the other, second one is patience, persistence, and perseverance pays off. Say that to times fast. <laughs> it's an interview I did with a couple students. It took them about two years to get their first deal, but it was the third time they went after the deal. They made sure that they got the right deal, not just a deal for the sake of getting a deal. So they talk about the ups and downs of what they went through to actually get it. You get that, the, the, the audio program is a bonus just for being here tonight. So make sure you get this on your way out the door. And then on the 30th, let me know that you listened to it and what you thought of both programs. Okay? I also have a four-day boot camp. As Steve mentioned earlier, I'm going to be coming back right here to Atlanta, so you don't have to go anywhere unless you want to go someplace else. June 6th through the 9th, it'll be somewhere in this area. And these are four of the seven steps that we're going to be going through. From finding the deals, you'll be learning over uh, 18 different ways that we've utilized to find deals. How to do a quick analysis in five to 10 minutes, not five to 10 days or five to 10 weeks. How to make an offer that gets recognized by the seller so that you go to the top of the offer pile instead of the bottom of the offer pile. Financing. I will show you 12 different ways that you can finance a deal from traditional methods to non-traditional and more creative methods like subject twos, wrap mortgages, master lease options, things like that. Additionally, I'm going to teach you due diligence. Once you get the paperwork from the seller that you're going to ask them for, what do you do with it? It's one thing to get it, it's another thing to know what to do with it and how to analyze it to make sure that you're getting the right deal. Negotiations before and after you go under contract. You're going to negotiate some when you go under contract, but you're going to negotiate more potentially after you do your due diligence on the property. And then all the way through the closing table. What could you, should you expect from the closing table? What kind of documentation should you look for? What should you do if it's wrong? I also teach you about different deals that I've done over the course of the weekend. What went right and what went wrong? We've actually lost a couple of properties to foreclosure. And I'm gonna show you what we did wrong so you don't repeat our mistakes and lose your property. Michael in San Diego has spent over $100,000 in financial workshops and real estate workshops and boot camps. And this, my four day boot camp, is one of the two best he's ever taken. One of the things that I do that nobody else does is I offer a double your money back guarantee at the four-day boot camp. You come all four days. At the end of the four days, if you tell me it wasn't worth your time or trouble, I will give you twice your money back. Because most of you in here probably never heard of me until you started getting emails from Georgia. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I don't do any marketing. All my marketing goes through Georgia and the National Real Estate Investors Association. Their word of mouth. As Steve mentioned, they actually get together, Rick mentioned, they get together once a year in June, and they all talk about speakers like me and what they call the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it's about speakers that actually provide more than what they promised or more than what they promised compared to speakers that didn't provide hardly anything and some speakers, speakers that didn't provide anything at all. <clears throat> so as Steve mentioned, I'm, the last four, five, six years in a row, I've been number one or number two speaker as far as then they take votes and they talk about what they like and what they didn't like. So I want you to come take a chance on me. That's why I'm willing to offer the double your money back guarantee so you can come. There's actually some students here who have been there. Dino's been to the class a couple of times. You like the class, Dino? I do. Excellent. Do. Do, do, is Walter still in the back or did Walter? Walter snuck out on me. Walter's actually gone out and bought several properties over the last couple of years, so he's doing great. As this says, uh, Kiyosaki's made money with apartments. I don't know if you knew this or not, but what allowed him to quit his job at Xerox and write the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad was he had two apartment buildings that generated $7,000 a month in passive income. Okay, that's what got him out of the rat race. So, there's the home study course. 
If you go to my website, by itself it's $9.95. The boot camp by itself is an additional $9.95. But wait. <laughs> if, whether you can or cannot come to the one day workshop on Saturday, guess what? There's six one hour videos on here of the one day workshop. So you can go back and review these before or after or during the workshop itself. That's also included as a bonus. I guarantee my program twice. I already told you about the double your money back guarantee. On the home study course, you have one full year to use the home study course. One full year to put it into action, go out and make offers and do whatever you need to do to get an apartment building, a multifamily property. If you tell me within 365 days that it didn't work for you and you went out and did exactly what I taught you to do, I will give you 100% of your money back. Got it? Got it? Okay. <laughs> So the last thing I do is I want you to take action after the four day boot camp. So along with the class, along with the home study course, along with the four day boot camp, along with the downloads of the one day workshop, there's an eight week follow up coaching program with step by step instructions that you'll be utilizing with a small group of other investors from your boot camp to take action and start going out and looking at deals and potentially putting in offers. It's very, very common for students to have deals under contract by the end of the eight weeks. That's the whole purpose of the eight-week program, is not for you just to come to the four-day class and learn a lot of stuff and go home and put your books and, and stuff on the shelf. It's to take action and be successful. Isn't that why you take these classes? The eight-week program is included in the whole package. So here's what you get. Because Georgia and all the other RIAs that I speak at want me to bundle it all together and give you a killer deal. It's $1,195, and that's for two people. <laughs> Got it? Only two, yes, only two. But wait, can you do better? No, this is it. <laughs> but wait, there's no more. <laughs> That's basically six for $600 per person, and you can invite anybody you want. For $600 per person, you each get your own flash drive. You each get to come to a boot camp. You don't even have to come to the same boot camp. If you don't like your spouse, you don't have to come to the same boot camp. You can come to Atlanta, and you can send your spouse to some, someplace else. All right? You get the flash drive. You get the one-day workshop. You each get to participate in the eight-week follow-up program. But wait, oh, there is one, yeah, sorry. Here are the different classes that are coming up around the country. By the way, there's no magic to these. Some people say, are you doing these because these are the hot markets? No, I'm doing these because national RIA people all get together and talk about me and all the other speakers. These are the ones that invite me to come in. Matter of fact, this is my, I mentioned earlier, this is my third time here. That was actually my first time in Memphis, my second time in Miami, I'm going back to my fourth time in Baltimore. Uh, third time in Orlando, uh, third, fourth, actually this will be yeah, my third time here, Chicago I'm going back for the second time, all these other places I'm going back for the second, third, fourth, fifth time. <laughs> Take advantage of this, I got a couple more bonuses, or one more bonus for you, again that's $11.95, so for $600 per person, most people charge that for just their home study course. So you get the home study course, and the 40 boot camp, and the 8 week follow up, all included for $600 a person. <laughs> Double your money back guarantee, I already told you that. <laughs> That's everything you get, flash drive, seat at the boot camp, everybody gets all that. Lastly, here's what else you get. If you sign up tonight, effectively you're also saving an additional $200 to $350. Why? Because you get, number one, you get to come on Saturday the 30th for free if you sign up tonight. Number two, if you wait until Saturday, this price, the $11.95 price is good until 9 a.m. on Saturday the 30th. Once the one day workshop starts, the price of the program goes up. So take advantage of it, and if you take advantage of it tonight, you can come on Saturday for free. If you leave tonight and call tomorrow and say, hey, George Rhea, I'd like to sign up and get the Saturday workshop for free. They already know, the answer is no. You need to sign up tonight, and you get the extra bonus of coming on Saturday for free. You can still sign up anytime you want to, but then you're also gonna have to pay for Saturday as well. And by the way, I'd love to have you pay for Saturday because it helps defray the cost of everything that Georgia Rhea does as far as providing their space and all the stuff that goes along with it. So, there's no more, sorry. But wait, there's no more. Any questions I can answer anybody? Yes? Would you recommend 
somebody who has the ability to build new? When I recommend to somebody who has the ability to build new, I would say it's more than just if you have the ability, it's also about timing. What you have to look at is, does it cost you less to build in a market, or does it cost you less to buy in the market? If the answer is it costs you less to build, build. If it costs you less to buy, buy. So it may seem easy, but it's not as easy as it make it sound. There's some difficulty to it. You have to understand the market, because it doesn't necessarily work in each and every market. You have to understand the market and what's going on. And obviously, if you can build, that's great, but if you're overbuilding, then you all of a sudden you start having more vacancy and the value of the property start going down. Yes, sir? So how much is the software? How much is the software? Yeah. The, the quick analysis software? The software is still there, just the software. Just the software. Are you coming on Saturday the 30th? Yes. Are you signing up now? All right, sign up. Here's your cost. You ready? Zero. Zero. Okay. Yay. Don't get too excited, everybody. As long as you sign up before the 22nd, the software on Saturday is free. Anthony, he's talking about the software that comes with the boot camp. Oh, the, home, st the home study the course. Home study course, yes. You're talking about the home study course? Yes. All the other software? That's the one he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the, on Saturday, after 9 o'clock, everything go, it goes up 100 bucks. It goes up to twelve ninety five, so you're saving it. You're basically missing out on another hundred bucks. It's going to cost you extra hundred bucks. To buy this today, it's eleven ninety five for two people. Eleven ninety five for two people. So six hundred dollars a person. Split it with anybody you want. Six hundred dollars per person. You get that whole thing. All thirty seven fives. There is no better value on the market, guys. That's the reason I'm willing to give you a double your money back guarantee, guys. I will continue to answer your questions. In the meantime, I know it's 9 o'clock, it's time to go. Thank you guys very much for listening.